Welcome back. Now that Bob Mueller is finally finished with his investigation, Democrats, they're taking over and they're looking into many aspects of both the president as well as administration. But the president, he's refusing to go, as they say, quietly into the good night. He's not cooperating at all. That includes fighting every single subpoena, including those that are calling for former White House counsel Don McGahn to testify before the House Judiciary Committee. Here he is yesterday. The subpoena is ridiculous. We have been, I have been the most transparent president and administration in the history of our country by far. We're fighting all the subpoenas. He may be finding, fighting all the subpoenas, but um, whatever the opposite of transparent is, that's our president. Now, he is also directing, and he also directly is contradicting, I should say, the Mueller report. And what McGahn said under oath, here he is via tweet, quote, as has been incorrectly reported by the fake news media. By the way, he, he McGahn testified under oath to this, so I, I don't know how it's our fault, but I digress. Quote, I never told then White House counsel Don McGahn to fire Robert Mueller, even though I had the legal right to do so. If I wanted to fire Mueller, I didn't need McGahn to do it. Joining me now, former federal prosecutor Ariana Berg. And, and Ariana, I've heard a lot of folks, including friends of the program, say when the president went on that tweet storm, he really hurt himself when it came to executive privilege, specifically with the comments about McGahn. Do you agree with that and why? Yes, I, I absolutely agree with that. I, in the first instance, he's, he's clearly waived any assertion of executive privilege. It's worth noting here he's not asserting executive privilege. He's just kind of stating a blanket uh, assertion that he's not going to comply with any House subpoena or Senate subpoena. Um, so he hasn't even asserted a, a, a lawful a legal ground. But assuming that it's executive privilege that he intends to rely upon, he's now at least three times waived any assertion of executive privilege. He waived it when he allowed McGahn to so extensively cooperate with the special counsel. We're told that it was apparently 30 hours that McGahn spe spent with the special counsel. And then he waived it again with regard to the release of the Mueller report when he failed to assert executive privilege there. And then finally, Rich, as you point out, his tweets and his public comments about what he did or didn't ask McGahn to do, uh, there again, he's, he's waiving any assertion that these are confidential communications that McGahn can't testify to. So in a sense, you can't put the toothpick paste back into the tube. It's already been let out. Ariana, give a little civics lesson for our audience, because sometimes if you just go by uh, the presidential tweet storm or what he'll say in a gaggle, you would believe that a president would be exempt from congressional investigation. A president um, could decide when to end congressional probes. And a president can decide on his or her own, or own discretion when to even comply with the subpoena. Forget about that he hasn't been called to task right now. Give a little bit of an explanation about what the whole idea of separation of powers and checks and balances were. Congress not only can do those things, but the president just can't decide, yeah, uh, yeah, subpoena all you want. I'm not going to respond, let alone comply. Yeah, that's that's the thorny thing. I mean, Trump's really f forcing this issue. So now we're really got this this battle between the Congress, the legislative branch, and the president, the executive branch. And it's really coming to a head now. You know, normally, um, you know, per your civics lesson, normally the president needs to comply with congressional oversight and congressional investigations, but he does have valid grounds to, say, object to certain parts, say he won't comply with some subpoenas because they, they go into confidential communications that would be covered by an executive privilege or perhaps communications that might be covered by an attorney-client privilege. Here, like we we stated before, he's not even asserting those things. What happens here, though, and Trump well knows it, is it's 
it's probably not going to succeed as a legal matter. Privilege has been really narrowly construed by the Supreme Court, specifically in the U.S. versus Nixon case, where Nixon had to turn over those tapes, those smoking gun tapes. And the Supreme Court there explicitly found that that was not covered by executive privilege and narrowly said executive privilege really only applies mostly to top secret national security conversations, which here uh, that would not apply as to whether he ordered McGahn to talk to Rod Rosenstein and directed him to fire Mueller. So he doesn't really have a legal leg to stand on. However, it's very likely to get slogged through the court system. That can take time. That's probably a political calculus that Trump and his legal team has already made, and that's the reason why they're doing it. So legally, in the end, probably not successful, but buys him a ton of time. The real question, though, is what's the, is he, is he making a miscalculation in terms of politically, will this backfire on Trump? If he's seen as being so obstructionist, thumbing his nose at congressional oversight wholesale, saying he won't comply whatsoever with any of their subpoena requests, what does the public take from that? Do they see him really as someone who is not transparent, like he claims, and is really trying to hide things from the public? That could really backfire for him. Ariana, give me the likelihood, and also, you know, how soon, that the financial records um, that the head of the Oversight Committee, Congressman Cummings, is trying to get a hold of, uh, he gets, that we hear from McGahn, um, and even on a sidebar note, uh, they're trying to get Stephen Miller to testify. I can argue there's a compelling reason when this is the person creating immigration policy. You know, part of the job of Congress is, you know, on the actual policy front to find out, you know, from the shapers of it, the thinkings behind it, et cetera. What's the likelihood we're going to hear from these people or that they'll get to get these documents? Hmm. Well, I, I wish I had a crystal ball and I could see the future. You know, these kind of battles, most recently, I'd say in the past 15 years between the executive branch and the legislative branch, have really hit its height. And as we've seen from the George W. Bush administration with the mass firing of the U.S. attorneys and also with even the Obama administration with the Fast and Furious program where Congress was really trying to exercise its oversight muscles and get this information, but we saw it get bogged down in the court system and, in fact, took years. And so I wish I had a crystal ball. I wish I knew how soon we would get to hear from these people. I think if it goes through the court system, we have a strong likelihood the law is on Congress's side on this part, but we just don't know how long it's going to take. And all this, um, as um, there is ongoing investigations, more than a dozen, with your old stomping grounds in the Southern District of New York, the Eastern District, uh, the Attorney General in New York, um, so those investigations go on, and there's nothing uh, the Commander-in-Chief can do uh, to stifle them. So a lot to keep an eye on. Ariana, I appreciate the time, as always. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, everybody, when we come back, we thought we'd have a little history lesson. RFK, Robert F. Kennedy, in his own words, the author of a new book about the late senator and presidential candidate. He'll join us after the break.